Hello everyone, welcome back to, from lunch. Uh, my name is Shachar Shemesh. I'm going here to talk to you about uh, C++ integer promotion as well as uh, other languages. And um, first uh, I'd like to say a few things about myself. Let me introduce myself. You don't care, rightfully so, I might add. Um, okay, um, so before speaking about C++, and, C++ uh, integer promotion is pretty much the same as the C integer promotion. Uh, so let's actually look at an example, uh, which is this. So let's create a file.ex1.c and let's define a function like we all do in C, right? Everybody writes this way, right? And the thing is, hmm? well, yes, but um, what you see here is actually contemporary C. And uh, to prove it to you, um, if I try to actually compile it uh, with a modern compiler, um, the only thing it has to say is uh, ruining my uh, surprise point for the next uh, po po thing I wanted to ask you about, but it did actually uh, compile the, the program. So, um, yes, uh, C has changed since, but it, it, it evolved rather than change. This is actually still legal C. And um, the question is, what is main's return value? Anyone? Int. It doesn't say so. It, it does say what ARGC and ARGV are, um, not the way we're, what we wish it would say it, but it does say what they are. It doesn't say what main returns. So how, how come it's int? That's the default. So here's the thing. Um, C has a very strong bias towards int. Um, if you don't tell it what a function returns, it assumes it returns int. GCC, modern GCC has the decency to warn you that that's what it's do it does, but still, that's what it does. Um, it also assumes int on things that you don't declare otherwise. For example, if you um, use a function without declaring it, it assumes it returns int and it assumes it gets an unknown number of variables. The, for, for a long time, that was the only way to use printf in C because there were, between when printf was defined and when the variadic functions were defined, varg and the, and the, and the others, the, that was the only way to declare printf because um, the only way to declare printf was not to declare it because you didn't know how many arguments it received. And the thing is printf returns int because that's the default. And um, while you might think this is an interesting, though irrelevant, backstory, because this is obviously not legal C++ code. Um, in fact, um, fun point, fun fact, the current C syntax it actually arrived at C from C++. C++ needed to have the uh, vari the arguments well declared inside the argument types inside the declaration so that they could support overloads. So Strasdorp changed the syntax. He didn't want to, but he had no choice. And then C inherited that syntax from C++ as well as a bunch of other things that people say, yeah, it's the same in C and C++. It's the same in C and C++ because C uh, followed C++. But this is not valid C++ syntax. So you might wonder why I bring it up. So let's look at a C++ function, right? Um, sorry, uh, still a C function, but uh, one with a syntax which is more uh, uh, palatable for us. Um, let's go the std int route. spelled correctly. Um, and let's define um, um, supposedly simple function. So um, it receives an int uh, and it co it's called add and it 
get two integers. And it returns A plus B. So it gets two 8-bit unsigned integers, and it returns an unsigned integer, 8-bit. How many implicit cuts are in this function? Three. Three. Right. Because um, even though it gets 8-bit integer and it returns 8-bit integer, um, it actually does the plus as... Uh, uh, as as a 32-bit uh, integer. Right. So, the definition of char short int and long in C uh, is that char is 8-bit, and then uh, short is greater or equal in size to char. Int is greater or equal in size to short. And uh, long is greater or equal in size to int. And um, in modern 64-bit CPUs, the, we, we sort of settled on char is 8-bit, short is 16, int is 32, and long is 64, because that seemed it, it, it matches the definition, and we have every uh, power of 2 or every uh, reasonable power of 2 uh, represented. Uh, but um, the answer for 8-bit CPUs is, I don't know. <laughs> and you can take me to the bank with that. And, um, but definitely we're on, on the modern CPU where int is 32 bits, um, this involves uh, actually two conversions from 8-bit uh, to 32-bit and then one conversion of the result from 32-bit back to 8-bit. Um, and you might wonder, so what? I mean, the title of, the, of, of my lecture was a bit, seems a bit hyperbolic, completely broken. Yeah, so we converted up and then we converted down. But if you take the converted down in isolation, what we did here is truncate a value from 32-bit to 8-bit and not issue a single warning. Let, let that sink in for a second. We, we took a value that has 32 bit of precision. We truncated most of it away. And the compiler did not think this is something that we need to hear about. This is, the compiler did not think this is something that might cause problems. Now, you might say, well, in this case, it almost cannot cause problems, right? Uh, but the thing is, um, I can actually do something that distills just the problem. I can say, okay, so truncate, and uh, I get a, a u in 32, and I return it. And let, let's do some uh, main just so I can compile it. He'd figure it out. Um, that's because it's EX2. And no warnings. And um, you might say, okay, well, you know, okay, uh, uh, let's, let's ask it to uh, W all. Um, nope, still no warning. Still no warning. Uh, what about C++? Still no warning. This goes without warning. And this goes without warning because you cannot both promote anything with the slightest excuse to int and warn when you truncate uh, a value. 
And do you know why I know that you cannot? The reason I know you cannot do that is because D tried. D has two rules governing its uh, expression uh, evaluation rules. And uh, well, it has more, but th th there are two relevant ones. The first one is that any expression that is uh, a valid C expression and compiles in D has to have the same semantic in D as it does in C, which kind of makes sense. You say, well, you know, you, you want to copy code written in C over, and if it compiles, we want it to work. So we want it to have the same semantics. Uh, the other rule says um, no narrowing conversions. So anything that uh, um, starts off as 32-bit and needs to be truncated to 8-bit requires an explicit cast. It cannot be done implicitly. So if, if, we, take, um, if we take the same code we just wrote and we, write, we say, okay, let's write the same program in D. I'm doing this so out of sequence. Um, you need, um, what's the flag are you? W pedantic. W pedantic. Are you happy? Because I'm not. <laughs> I, I can't call it this happy. Um, okay, so uh, let's um, uh, do some uh, imports. And um, if, if you expect C++ to be the only language covered in this uh, lecture, then I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, and uh, this is the way uh, D decided to call its 8-bit uh, integers. And we do return A plus B, which seems innocent enough. And if we try to compile this, we cannot. The D implicitly enhanced our uh, U byte to U int, and then said, well, you, no, this is U int and this is U byte. You can't feed them together. I mean, what, what were you thinking? And um, I think I could maybe live with that, but it does that no matter what the operator is, so long as C does the expansion, which means even if I try to XOR them together, actually, that should work, yeah. Okay. Um, it should work, but it's a very interesting uh, to see why. Uh, but let, let me get back to that in a second. Um, before that, I would like to present to you the only case in which I could think of, in which we actually maybe want this implicit expansion. So um, let's do example four. Uh, let's do that CPP, it doesn't matter. Um, and it looks like this. If you do uint8 average of
So that's a, um, a valid uh, C++ program, obviously, I think. Let, let's make sure. That, does every, everyone understand what happened just, just happened here? Uint8 is a char type. So instead of outputting three, it output uh, uh, escape uh, the, the, the ASCII for uh, uh, break. Why they do that for unsigned char is beyond me, but never mind. So um, that obviously works, and um, the, where that saves us is um, if we want to do 254 and 252, then that would maybe surprisingly actually print 253 because A and B get promoted to int and then uh, uh, the divide by two actually gets the right number. There was no overflow. Um, I'm going to wager a guess here and say that none of you would rely on this behavior. And um, in addition to that, it's very tempting to do this. Well, maybe not like this because most of you don't like Vim, but <laughs> and um, that would work for uh, uh, uint8, obviously, but will probably not work so well for uint32 if we just take. Uh, uh, Once is enough, I think. <laughs> I think. Um, so we get a number that is way too small. So um, it, it's not a good choice of an algorithm because it only works in those edge cases. Now, like I said, I wouldn't mind the, um, the uh, implicit conversion, uh, converting everything to int if it also didn't automatically include explicitly, implicitly converting everything from int or everything will be errors. And like I said, uh, D tried that route, saying, okay, well, uh, we will convert ev everything uh, implicitly to int uh, uh, because that's what C does, but let's not convert everything back. And um, I wrote, uh, I wrote uh, an implementation of RAID in D, and that's a lot of bit manipulation. Now, bit manipulations, there's no chance in hell that you'll get overflows. But converting everything to int all the time um, meant a lot of costs, a lot of costs. That was way annoying. And more than annoying, I'll talk about that in a second. So how come that previous program we did actually compiled? Remember, we, we, we did uh, a, a plus b divided by 2 or, or whatever, and, and it actually worked. It, didn't, it did compile. And um, no, before that. And the reason is something called value range propagation. D um, uh, does the following. So th that compiled, but adding plus did not compile. Why? What's the difference? So? So? Okay. Here's the thing. The type actually was promoted to int because that's what C does. But D also introduces something called value range propagation. It tracks, about all, the it tracks all the possible values A might have and all the possible values B might have. 
And then it asks, what are the pass possible range that A XOR B might have? And since A XOR B cannot possibly be more than the eight bits that we got for A and B, um, it says since X or B cannot be more than 255, that's okay to convert it to U byte. And that was supposed to be the savior, the savior of this, uh, the thing that will save us from all those errors. Like I said, in practice, I didn't find it worked well enough. Which um, brings us to the, uh, everyone's favorite uh, new kid on the block. What does Rust do? It is everyone's favorite, right? I mean, especially here. Uh, which, uh, what number are we up to? Let's go uh, five, right. Uh, so, um, we get uh, unsigned eight bit, we return unsigned eight bit. And uh, the way um, we do that in uh, Rust is we just don't write a semicolon. And that works. Does it work? Um, well, no me. Okay. Um, That works, but that doesn't. Anyone want to guess what it does? It's a runtime assert. And that's actually a very reasonable thing to do. But um, then we say, okay, uh, let's, let's, do the, let's force it to do the, the uh, C thing and uh, actually promote. So um, we go A uh, as U16. Right? That ought to be enough. And it's not. The reason it is not is it says cannot add U8 and U16. So this clause is unsigned 16-bit, but this clause is unsigned 8-bit, and it won't add them together. Let that sink in a second. It won't promote, it won't promote 8-bit to 16-bit. So now we need to promote B as well. And now we have a 16-bit result, which needs to fit in an 8-bit return type. So we need to cast that as well. And now we finally have a program that compiles and run hooray. Except it looks like this. Now, um, I promised I'll, I'll explain my opinion about, um, about uh, a, a explicit cast. So this is an explicit cast in C. This is an explicit cast in C++. This is an explicit cast in D. And this is an explicit cast in Rust. And my question is, what do they all, all have in common? I'm not searching. They all have the letter C, but um, <laughs> except the C one. <laughs> yeah, well, if we didn't have C, we'd all still be writing in a, a basic Pasal and Obol. <laughs> what they all have in common is that they only specify the destination type. They do not specify the source type. Now, the, for a good reason, it would be 
ex exceedingly verbose and unpleasant to work if every static type had to specify both source and destination file. But this is also error prone. It means that whatever it is you gave me, I'm now trying to squeeze it into this round hole that I have, whatever it is. And if it, it all fits, then that's fine, and the program continues. So the more explicit costs we have, um, the more error prone the program is, the programming is. And uh, Rust's, um, Rust's solution of never doing implicit casts of any kind is, is pretty much like uh, Windows Vista saying, well, you have to authorize anything you do. It's secure in the sense that you can never blame Rust for introducing bugs to you, but it gives you no tools to, to actually make informed decisions, or, or, or it doesn't help you in the decision-making process. So at this point, I'm sure you ask, well, if you're, such opinion, you're so opinionated about it, what's your solution? If, if I were to write my own programming language from scratch, saying I don't owe any alliance to anyone, I don't need to support any backwards compatibility, what would I do? How would I do it? And the answer is, I can't answer that because I am writing my own programming language. Um, and uh, it's called the practical. And um, to sum up my uh, practical um, integer promotion rules, um, in a word, the answer is, it's complicated. And the idea is, it's complicated for the compiler, and it's complicated for you if you want to reason about them. But the end result is that when you write an expression, there are two options. Either it compiles and it works without introducing bugs, or it doesn't compile. Now, get going into the details, it looks something like this. First, there's no implicit value narrowing, which means that, um, yes, practical does not implicitly allow converting from an unknown 32-bit value to an unknown 8-bit value signed, but it also doesn't allow you to uh, implicitly convert from a signed 8-bit value to an unsigned 8-bit value, or for that matter, from a signed 8-bit value to an unsigned 64-bit value. Because a, a signed 8-bit value might be minus 1, and an unsigned 64-bit value cannot hold that value. So any implicit conversion that might cut off values from the, the variable is not allowed. But we do use value range propagation in order to try and figure out what is allowed. So um, no promotion to accommodate overflows. And in fact, following Rust's example, I, I'm going to change that into overflows are undefined behavior and under debug, they, they outright assert. And, but then again, value range propagation greatly reduces the number of checks you have to do. Because if you know the value cannot overflow, then the if gets optimized away. And uh, if you do binary type operations on two different types, then um, you actually get promoted to a minimal common type. So if, if you're uh, adding a signed 8-bit and an unsigned 8-bit, uh, the result is a signed 16-bit. We, we find the, the minimal value that uh, can accommodate the answer no matter what it is. Again, not, not including overflows. And we use expected result type. Uh, to, to explain that what it is, I'm hope... One last example, can I... Can I uh, okay. I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to pretend I didn't see a D telling me that my time is up. Um, so uh, uh, this is practical. Let's define um, um, average of uh, A, U, 8, B. The syntax is actually uh, uh, pretty similar on that front to, um, to Rust. And um, we want to start with A plus B divided by 2, right? But like, like we already saw, we need the intermediate value to be 16-bit. Uh, so I need a cast. 
Now, uh, under C, I would probably cast the A to 16-bit and trust it to cast everything else. Under practical, I can do something else. I can do expect U16 on the entire thing. What I'm saying here is that the whole thing in the end is supposed to be 16, unsigned 16-bit. That gets propagated through the syntax tree and the, the variables get promoted the earliest they can. So despite the fact that I casted the entire expression, the A and B got promoted to 16-bit. The, the um, addition was in 16-bit. It was divided by two. So everything was 16-bit. And then it will got truncated to 8-bit because value range propagation said that's not a problem. Um, let's try to run it. Um, because practical is exceedingly a work in progress, I don't have printing facilities, so I'm actually going to use main's return value to prove to you that I'm uh, okay. Um, Uh, the compiler prints out the LLVM intermediate representation. For, it's, it's a debug uh, code. Um, and if I print out what the program returned, it returned 253. Now, if, if I eliminate the expect, then I, I'm going to get the wrong answer. However, if I change this to U16, that actually works. No, it's not obvious because you'll notice that merely changing the function's return type changed the promotion that took place because uh, a practical backpropagated the, the expected return type to the earliest point where we did the addition. It's not something trivial, it's not something other languages do. Is there a paper giving you any such type of thing? Um, I guess, yes. Uh, uh, well, Um, I'm, I'm actually haven't implemented size of yet, so I'm not sure uh, uh, about that. The, the um, generic way, th this goes, if I had an hour, I'd start talking about uh, 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 the way overloads work, because that's what happened here. The, in essence, there are uh, breakpoints where you cannot propagate the expected value. Okay. Um, Thank you very much.